There was nothing normal about that very first Palm Sunday. Jesus didn't do normal. <laughs> Palm Sunday was the, it was the world's smallest parade, <laughs> and Jesus was the only attraction. If you had been a visitor to Jerusalem that week, you would have previously witnessed a Roman parade. Pontius Pilate had also recently entered Jerusalem from his home in Caesarea. His parade would have been a complete display of Rome's military might. Pilate would have been perched atop a majestic steed, and he would have displayed all the trappings of Roman wealth and prestige. His Roman officers would have been wearing polished armor, carrying banners of captured enemies, or displaying the symbol of Rome, the Aquila, or the, the Roman eagle. Pilate's parade would have been all about superiority, and it sent a message to everybody who was gathering in the city because of the recent Passover activities. Rome was saying, keep the peace or else. Today, if that same parade went down our street, it would be uh, police officers carrying rifles and billy clubs, followed by police cars with blinking lights. So the Palm Sunday parade with Jesus on a donkey was different. So the people began asking, who is this? because Jesus doesn't do normal, because nothing would have seemed more unlikely. I mean, here comes Jesus. He's another type of king, but a king riding on a donkey. And he doesn't look like a king. There's no crown, no army marching behind him, no banners flying in the wind. The Romans would have been laughing if they had seen such a spectacle. A homeless king riding on a borrowed donkey his saddle was a makeshift layer of cloaks attended by an unruly mob whose only weapons were palm branches. But this little donkey was part of the great plan of redemption that God had for all of creation. And only Jesus knew how all of this was going to end. Ironically, he knew the same people who were shouting praises to God would only five days later be screaming, crucify him. He also knew that Jerusalem was where his greatest enemies had the most power. He also knew they wanted to kill him. But he also knew that it was all part of a larger plan, a prophesied plan. And I think this morning, most of us know the general outline of the story, but I suspect what many of us have not looked at was all the close details. Why did Jesus send two disciples ahead to borrow a donkey? He, he's walked into Jerusalem hundreds of times before. He, he's healed people in Jerusalem before. So why now ride on the back of a donkey? Why are the people waving palm branches? Why are they shouting Hosanna as he passes by? What does all of this mean? Well, I think first of all, we tend to think of Palm Sunday as a special event. I mean, more special than Jesus' miracles or his teachings, and it's no wonder we make a big deal about it in church. We always set aside this Sunday as Palm Sunday. Well, we dare not preach any other topic on this Sunday, but in truth, that one day was just one more day in a life of Jesus. Every day for Jesus, from his birth to his ascension, was part of of a plan. It was all orchestrated ahead of time. Today we're going to look at Psalm 118. Psalm 118 was more than likely written by David, and it's especially fitting for today because that psalm is about deliverance. It proclaimed God's deliverance from Egypt, and later on the Jews would also use it to speak about the exile. It was more than likely a liturgy that you would sing on your way to the temple during the feast of Passover. If you look at verses 19 and 20, it says, Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord and the righteous shall enter through it. Jesus entered in on a donkey through a gate in Jerusalem, but the psalm calls it the gates of righteousness. Now, obviously, this verse does not specifically say that it's Jesus who enters in. But certainly, 
we could apply it to him in this moment. In verse 20, the gate is called the gate of the Lord, or the Lord's gate, and that the righteous will enter through it. Well, certainly there is no one more righteous than Jesus, and if he is the one riding through, then certainly it is the Lord's gate. Look at the next few verses. 21 says, I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Does that verse sound familiar? It should, because Jesus quotes it in one of his parables. Let me read it to you. Mark 12, Jesus tells the story, a man planted a vineyard and put down a fence around it and dug a pit for the wine press and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again, he sent to them another servant. And they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another, and him they killed. And so with many others, some they beat and some they killed. He had still one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, This is the heir, come, let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read the scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. That's Psalm 118. Did you know that when Jesus told this parable, he was quoting Psalm 118. And do you know when he quotes it? Do you know when he tells this story? Right after Palm Sunday, right after he walks into town on a donkey, right after the religious leaders question him about who he is and where he gets his authority from. And to answer them, Jesus tells a story about a son who was sent into a vineyard where the employees who worked there, the employees who his father hired, killed him. And then Jesus quotes Psalm 118 and says, who am I? I am the stone the builders rejected. But the joke is on them. Because it turns out, you think I'm this worthless stone, but I am the most important stone. I am the stone that everything else is built on, the cornerstone. And then verse 22 has two really cool statements that you can miss them if you're not too careful. First, it says, this is the Lord's doing, meaning this moment. Don't miss it. Watch now. Lord is doing this. This is, this is not a human design. This is not a human mortal plan. This is a divine plan. This is a heavenly plan. And second, it says, it is marvelous in our eyes. That word marvelous in the Hebrew, it's like saying uh, miraculous. In other words, it's difficult to do and it's difficult to understand. It's completely otherworldly. It's like watching an eclipse. It's like standing beneath the aurora borealis. The arrival of Jesus as the righteous one through the Lord's gate, to watch that would be to cause wonder and excitement and to shed tears of joy all at the same time. And then look at verse 24. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We know this verse too, right? From the song. And certainly we sing this verse about Sunday. Sunday, right? Sunday is the day the Lord has made. It's our Sabbath. And Sunday is a day that we can sing and we would certainly say it's a day to be glad and a day to rejoice. But what if this verse is about Palm Sunday? One special Sunday. Well, then the verse reads completely different. Then Palm Sunday was a special day, set aside, aside to be the day. It's supposed to be the day, the, 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 the day that the stone the builders had rejected was now presented to the world, this day, this day is the day that all creation was waiting for, from Adam and Eve, to Moses, to Joshua, to David, the king of the Jews, 
rides through the streets. So let us rejoice. We wave palm branches and we rejoice in it. And now look at the verse that I think solidifies all of this and just brings all of this home. It says, save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. That's directly from the verse. And it connects us to Palm Sunday because it, it predicts with accuracy what the crowds would say when Jesus rode through the town that day. Like, Watch, Mark 11. Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and we'll send it back immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at the door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing untying that colt? And they told them what the Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's common for us to sing songs with the words Hosanna in them on Palm Sunday, right? But Hosanna doesn't mean praise or, or glory to, to the king. Hosanna means save us. The very same save us from Psalm 118, verse 25. And the crowds further solidify that belief because they complete the verse. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The name of the Lord is a biblical expression for the entire character of God. The name of the Lord refers to God's person. The Lord is our rock, he's our refuge, he's our fortress, he's our shepherd, he's our king, he's our redeemer. And the Lord's name is above all names because his name is holy. So the name of God is a place where righteous people find salvation. Here's another Old Testament prophecy about Palm Sunday. Zechariah 9.9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout aloud. O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, your king is coming to you righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So why a donkey, right? A donkey doesn't seem regal, doesn't seem majestic. It's not a kingly animal. Because I think globally the donkey is recognized as uh, a stubborn animal. Except when Jesus rides it. Then it seems obedient. Then it seems mild. Even though the Bible says that nobody had ever ridden it before. Look at this very interesting verse from Isaiah. The ox knows its owner and the donkey its master's crib. But Israel does not know my people do not understand. Isaiah, he's writing during a time when the kingdom of Judah is very sinful and they would not acknowledge God. And Isaiah contrasts their disbelief with a stubborn animal. And he says, you guys are the same. But then he says, Isaiah, Isaiah writes, yeah, but even a donkey knows its master. But God's people don't. They don't recognize their master. A donkey isn't showy. A donkey isn't flashy. A donkey isn't a beautiful animal. In fact, it's a pack animal, right? It's a worker. But there's something even more, much more wonderful than that. And it's perhaps a story that I'm sure we, we, we don't think about much at Easter time. Genesis 22 says, after these things, God tested Abraham. And he said, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. This was the test of tests. There's no greater pain than watching your child suffer and die. And Isaac was no ordinary child. He was the firstborn to his wife, a child of hope. He was a child of promise. God even stresses, this is the child you love and his only son. I mean, the parallel now to Easter is glaring, isn't it? John 3.16 reminds us, for God so loved the world that he gave his 
only Son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. Colossians 1.15 says he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. The Bible declares that Jesus is the firstborn and the only Son of God. And just like Isaac, he's laying upon an altar as ransom. But there's more. Look at how Genesis, Genesis 22 continues. So Abraham arose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. So we have at least one donkey recorded, and it's saddled, which means it's ridden. Was there more than one donkey? Did each person ride a donkey? Did Isaac and his father take turns riding it? We don't know. But someone rode it to the mountain, to the hill, for sacrifice. But not the same mountain, <laughs> right? I mean, Isaac is taken to Mount Moriah. Jesus is taken to Golgotha. Those have to be two separate places, right? Why would they be? Genesis 22 says God tested Abraham. And the test was to see whether Abraham would sacrifice his son. But Abraham, he could have taken that test anywhere. But God says, go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will show you. So consider this. God had Abraham travel 50 miles, which is over three days, from Beersheba to Jerusalem. God showed Abraham the specific place to sacrifice Isaac. Why wouldn't this be an account of what God would do later with his own son? Well, then why do they have two different names? Moriah means chosen by God. And this location for Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, uh, I believe, 2,000 years later is the same place where God would sacrifice his own son. Look at the next verse. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come back again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. And he took his hand, the fire, and the knife. So they went both of them together. Abraham is going to the place of sacrifice and death. But then he says, we will worship and return. I mean, talk about faith, right? Abraham would receive his son back to him. He believes that. He could not possibly know what God was about to do, but he believed that his son would be restored. Hebrews 11 says, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. The author of Hebrews says, who knows? Abraham trusted God enough that even if he was allowed to take his son's life, God had the power to bring him back. So Abraham confidently tells his servants, Stay here. We will both be back. But did you notice something else? Where does Isaac carry the wood for sacrifice? On his back. Isaac walks to the place of his own sacrifice with the wood on his back. John 19 says, he said to the Jews, behold your king. And they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to be crucified. So they took Jesus and he went out, bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull. Jesus, after having ridden to that same Jerusalem, on a donkey, not many days earlier, Jesus now carries a wooden cross on his back to another place, a place of sacrifice. It's no accident 
that these parallels exist. This is all planned. This is all intended. This is design. Good Friday was foreshadowed 2,000 years before it happened. From the time of Abraham till now, you and I are 4,000 years now closer to Jesus entering Jerusalem again for his second coming. You know, it seems like more and more I hear people say, ah, oh, we're living in the end times. It seems like, you know, the more you look around, the more you listen to the news, the more we believe we're even closer to Jesus' return. And sure, it, certainly we, we are all closer. Yes, every day we're closer for sure. But what do we know for sure? At Jesus' at Jesus's final appearance, he had some words for his disciples. The Bible records them in Acts chapter 1. It says, And when he had finished saying these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. You know, it's estimated that there are 150,000 graves on the Mount of Olives. Do you know why? Because the early church believed the words of the angel with all their heart. Jesus, who rose to heaven, his feet when they last touched earth, they touched the Mount of Olives. And when he comes back, the angel said, they would touch down there again. And the 150,000 Christians said, when Jesus comes back, when he makes his next triumphal entry into the world, I want to be someone in the crowd who gets to wave palm branches and shouts, Hosanna, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I may have missed that first Palm Sunday, but I'm not going to miss the next one. Are there any prophecies about the next Palm Sunday? Zechariah 14.4 says, On that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley, so that one half of the mount shall be northward, and the other half southward. This is a remarkable prophecy to which the angels at the Ascension were referring to. It speaks of the Battle of Armageddon, where the Messiah returns to his own people, and he will destroy all the forces of darkness. And then look at this one, Revelation 19. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, the one sitting on it called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like flames of fire, and on his head are the many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name of which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on a white horse. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepresses of the fury of the wrath of God, the Almighty." And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This first time Jesus came to Jerusalem as king, he was mounted on a donkey and he was riding in humility. But the second time he comes as the King of Kings, this time he will be mounted on a white horse. And death will be replaced with victory. Humility will be replaced with exalted glory. But did you notice the special name that Jesus has at the second coming? It says when he comes, he's going to have a name on his thigh. <laughs> Abraham had a son, Isaac. Isaac has a son, Jacob. And there's a story in the Bible about how Jacob changes his name to Israel. Genesis 32 says that night Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone. And a man 
wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched in his, in, as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. And Jacob said, please tell me your name. Jacob wrestles, a mysterious man in the Bible, and seems to be winning until this mystery person touched Jacob in the thigh, probably gave him a muscle spasm or a, a cramp. But you could say, well, wait, 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 Pastor David, it says hip socket, not thigh. True, but the Hebrew word there means thigh, or it means the place you would wear your sword. And then Jacob is told his name will now be Israel because he wrestled with God. But that's not enough for Jacob. He asks the mystery man, now tell me your name. So when I see Jesus returning to the Mount of Olives on a white horse with words, a title, a name written on his thigh, I think to myself, that is God's answer to Israel. Who am I? Who is the rider on the white horse? Who is the one that rides into Jerusalem on a donkey? Who is the one who takes Isaac's place on Mount Moriah? Who is the one who wrestles with Jacob? He is King of Kings. He is Lord of Lords. On Palm Sunday, Jesus comes humbly with the purpose of being the sacrifice for our sins. And this is certainly the reason that we celebrate Easter. But on the second occasion of his coming, he will be king of kings. Because to claim his people, that first entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, that was so important. But it's just a piece. It's just a piece of, a, of an even greater story. Christ comes to earth this first time as a sacrificial lamb, atoning for the sin and providing salvation for everyone through faith, but he will come a second time as the Lion of Judah, judging darkness. And anyone who's rejected him. And while I don't understand every aspect of his second coming, I do not live in fear of that day. I have placed my faith and trust in him. As a member of the body of Christ, I am promised eternity with Christ. What about you? Where do you stand today? Are you prepared to meet your Lord when he comes? Now is the time to make a preparation for that meeting. Maybe today is your Hosanna. Maybe today is the moment to grab a palm branch and to cry out to this Jesus to save you. A new life, a new beginning. It's that easy. And if you're ready for that, then I would invite you to bow your heads and pray this prayer. Dear God, thank you for sending your son Jesus so that I could be your friend. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for being with me all my life, even when I didn't know it. And I realize I need a savior to set me free from sin and from myself and from all the habits and hurts and hangups that mess up my life. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I wanna repent and live the way that you created me to live. Be the Lord of my life. Save me with your grace. I wanna to learn to love you and trust you and to become everything that you made me to be. Thank you for creating me and choosing me to be a part of your family. Amen. Hey, well, we are in 
Holy Week. So Palm Sunday always kicks off Holy Week, and it's uh, seven days till Easter. And so we just want to let you know what's happening in the life of our church. Uh, this Friday, of course, will be our Good Friday service. It'll be at 6.30 p.m. It'll be here in the sanctuary. We won't have anything for kids, but uh, they're more than welcome to come. It will be a little bit more of a you know, serious topic because we are talking about the cross, but it is important to have this moment to wrestle with the cross, to ask those tough questions, because it all prepares us for Easter morning. Resurrection Sunday uh, is happening at the end of the month, and we will have three services. The first one is at 7 a.m., and it'll be at the Yacht Club flagpole. We'll be out there, we'll have chairs set up for you, but if you'd like to bring your own lawn chair, uh, you're more than welcome to. It's gonna be a beautiful service as we watch the sunrise over the lake. And then we'll have two more services here in the sanctuary. The first one's at nine, and the second one is at 11. They will be completely identical. Please choose the one that works the best for your, you and your family. Of course, we will have childcare and something available uh, for the kiddos uh, during both hours, and we would love to be, see you, and we would love to be the church where you live. I'll see you guys Easter morning.